Hi, this is a lecture on water potential. <clears throat> okay, let's get started. So water potential describes the hydration state of the plant and breaks it down into components influencing the state. So we will see that water potential is a, a number, a value that we can calculate and we can calculate it out of its components. And we're gonna talk about what the water potential means, why it's important to know the water potential of a plant and how to calculate it. <clears throat> So in this example here, I have two cells. These are two boxes representing two cells that are adjacent to each other. And the question now is which factors would describe the potential of water to move between these two cells? So if we look at solutes, and these uh, letters are supposed to indicate certain solutes, um, a solute A in this case, <clears throat> in one cell, um, the concentration of these solutes in the lower cell is greater than the solute concentration in the uh, upper cell. And so the solute concentration will influence the movement of water because in osmosis, water always moves to the more concentrated solution. The second factor that would describe water potential and water movement within a plant is pressure. So if you have a lot of pressure on the outside of a cell, then that could basically squeeze out the water from that cell <clears throat> and um, move it into adjacent cells. Another way how this could happen, if there isn't outside pressure, there could also be inside pressure building up by the cell wall becoming thicker and therefore leaving less room for the water inside. A third aspect is gravity. So this would be an aspect that's particularly important for tall plants, trees, for example, where there's a difference in the gravity potential between um, the crown of a, of a tall tree and, for, for example, this, the trunk or the, um, the roots. And then late, uh, lastly, the matrix. The matrix is the consistency of the cell wall. So if you, for example, look at a cell wall that is slightly waxy, that would repel water, that would push water away from this cell and maybe towards this cell, if this cell has a cell wall that is um, more composed of cellulose or a substance that has more wicking qualities. <clears throat> How can you describe a reaction with respect to its energy flow in general? So we will want to talk about reactions and energy flow and energy controlling flow of water in our discussion of water potential. So let's step, one, let's step back a little bit and look at how we can describe energy flow in general. So in earlier classes, you have heard about exergonic and endergonic reactions. And so here's an example of an exergonic reaction. On the y-axis, you um, see the free energy, the Gibbs free energy. And then on the, on the uh, x-axis, we see the course of the reaction. So starting with the reactants, compounds that are reacting, um, and then leading to products after the reaction is over. In order for this reaction to occur in an exergonic reaction, energy is actually liberated. And you can see that because there's a higher energy state in the reactants than in the products. And so the delta G is smaller than G, than zero. And so that means that there's, um, a liberation of exergonic uh, of energy in an exergonic reaction. This part here, the Ea, um, that's the activation energy. And so that's the energy that's required for the reaction to occur, whereas at the end, the products actually contain less energy than at the beginning. <clears throat> an endergonic reaction is the opposite. Well, it's an endergonic reaction. You start with reactants that have a lower energy content than the products. So energy needs to be put into this reaction for it to, um, to proceed, not only with respect to the activation energy, which you also have here, but also with respect to the total Gibbs free energy change. So that's the delta G here that is in this case greater than zero. So these thermodynamic um, principles are what's guiding water movement and water potential as well. So in general, we have free energy. We have the potential for performing work, and that is what you can uh, what you can describe with a, with a value for delta G. So there is um, something that's called the chemical potential, and you can calculate the chemical potential for any 
chemical compound or for any chemical reaction. And what the chemical potential is, is the difference of potential in a given state versus a predefined standard state. And um, what, what I mean with that is that um, you can you always compare two things because there's a difference in energy that you're describing. And so the difference is a given state of a reaction of a, of a um, compound at a certain state, for example, under pressure or in a vacuum or at high temperature or low temperature and so forth. And that is compared to some sort of a, a standard, let's say um, uh, room temperature and um, uh, general atmospheric pressure. And so this difference is the free energy that describes the difference between these two states uh, of a compound. That's measured in joules per mole for the chemical potential. And you can also give that as an inherent potential for a chemi chemical compound. So chemical compounds have different chemical potentials. We don't need to go into that far, that, that far into chemistry, because the only compound that we're interested in with respect to its chemical potential is the water. And so for water, the chemical potential for water is called the water potential. Um, and you can give that for any type of solvent, so water in this case, with any kind of um, solutes inside it. And you can compare then that kind of water, for example, the cell uh, content, um, with pure water in an open container. And when I say open container, I mean that's the standard state because the only thing that presses on them, the pressure that ex is exerted on them, is that from the atmosphere. <clears throat> so we have pure solvent with no solutes in this comparison. And you can compare that, this standard state here, with um, the state of the water in a given plant cell. So water potential is measured as energy per volume um, cubic meters, which is equivalent to pressure units. So joule per cubic meter is also um, known as megapascal, and one megapascal is also known as 10 bars or 10 atmospheres. Those are all the same um, pressure state with different units um, is describing this state. So we will use megapascal. That is the unit that is usually used for describing the water potential in a plant. The equation for the water potential in a plant is put together out of sub uh, uh, sub portions of the uh, of this equation. So we have the water potential here, we have the solute potential, we have the pressure potential, and the gravity potential. And um, so the solute potential is also sometimes referred to as the osmotic potential. Essentially, those are the salt concentrations in the in the uh, solvent in the water. Oftentimes, gravity is ignored. In fact matrix potential, which some people will even add here as a plus psi m, is almost always ignored because it's very, very small compared to the other parts of the water potential. Gravity um, is often ignored, especially when you're thinking about a small plant as opposed to a tall tree. So if you ignore um, um, the gravity aspect of it, then this becomes just uh, the water potential equals the solute potential plus the pressure potential. So let's specifically look at these two components of the water potential um, equation. <clears throat> the water potential describes the likelihood of water to move from place A to place B. And that could be either into the plant or out of the plant. For example, in a drought or in salty um, concentrations and salty uh, conditions, there could be water lost from the plant to the surrounding. And so the movement of water is always from a less negative to a more negative potential. It always moves towards the negative. Um, and when I say here from a less to a more negative potential, you will see that almost always the values that we calculate for, um, for situations that we want to compare, place A to place B, are negative. And so therefore, it's important to think about this that you know, it goes to the negative, and so therefore it usually goes to the more negative rather than from actual positive to a negative value, which is possible. But in most cases, you will see that you will calculate negative values for both places. And then what this means is that it moves from the less negative to the more negative. Okay, so let's uh, look at the solute potential. And let's start by thinking about how two liquids with different salt concentrations differ in their properties. So. If you think about that, two different um, solutions, you have two different solutions, one is saltier than the other, 
Well, the saltier one will attract water by osmosis. And the reason for why you know that is that if you put those two in a um, beaker and you put a membrane, a semi semi-permeable membrane in between, and you just wait for a reaction to occur, an osmotic reaction to occur, water will move from the less salty to the more salty um, compartment. So that's something that we sort of know from, from uh, experience already. And the other thing that we also really already know from experience is that the melting point and the boiling point of a solution changes when there's salt inside. So um, the ocean or the Puget Sound will not freeze as readily as um, pure water because it's salty. And so um, it has to be colder than zero degrees Celsius for that kind of water to freeze. And those, um, that, that bit of information can be used to calculate uh, the concentration of the solutes in an unknown solution. So I'll tell you about how to do that in just a second. Let's just think a little bit more about the solute potential or the osmotic potential as it's sometimes called. So I said that um, salty solutions attract water. So maybe this is easy to remember if you think salt causes thirst. Um, and the contribution that the dissolved solutes have is to this movement of water. Solutes will always decrease the free energy of water. So this, the contribution is um, always negative unless it's zero. Okay, so how can, we, um, how can we measure the osmotic potential? Well, you can use something that's called a cryoscopic osmometer. And the cryoscopic osmometer, I'll show you a picture of that in a second, uses the, the following information basically as its uh, standard. So a solution with one mole of solutes in one liter of water lowers the freezing point by 1.9 degrees Celsius. So seawater, for example, contains just about one mole of all the soft ions. So that's not just the sodium chloride, but all the soft ions in its water. Um, and is about one mole, that's, the, that's about one mole. And if you measure the freezing point in seawater, you see that that is um, minus 1.9 degrees Celsius rather than zero. Let's add the R there as well. <clears throat> okay, so here's a cryoscopic osmometer. They come in different shapes and forms. Here's a, an example of how a, um, a cryoscopic, cryoscopic osmometer could look. So it's also, it also almost looks like a, a microscope, but it has a stage that can be controlled in its temperature. It has these little depressions in there, and these are the little depressions in there into which you can um, pipette a solution with an unknown um, solute concentration. And then you lower the temperature of the stage very slowly and very carefully while you look through the microscope to see whether or not the sample is liquid, just starting to produce the first ice crystals or is frozen. And at the, at the point where the change occurs from liquid to frozen, that's where you look at the temperature and where you, or, you, know, where you record from the, from the thermometer what the difference in temperature is. And if it's, let's say, one degree Celsius, then you would know that from your standard curve that you can make with a 1.9 um, degrees Celsius um, being equivalent to a one molar solution um, that you, know, you, you, can, you can then calculate what the concentration of the, uh, the solution is that you are that you're looking at depending on the temperature that uh, it has uh, required for it to freeze. So that's a cryoscopic osmometer. These days they're a lot fancier and you know, the, these values are um, calculated automatically, but this is the principle by which they work. Well, the osmotic potential can be, can be measured experimentally, as I just showed you, but it can also be calculated from an equation. And this equation is called the Fant-Hoff equation. And this is the equation. So the solute potential equals minus R times I times T times Cs. So let's see what these values here are. R is the gas constant. So the gas constant is always constant. It's a 0 0.008 megapascals per mole per Kelvin. So that always goes in there. No change is necessary. 
T is the temperature and the temperature um, of the system. So um, if you are looking at something that happens um, outside at um, 20 degrees Celsius, for example, then you would take um, the temperature in Kelvin, knowing that uh, zero degrees Celsius is 273 Kelvin. And so therefore 20 degrees Celsius would be 293 Kelvin. Or if you're looking at something that happens at four degrees, then this would be 277 Kelvin and so forth. And then CS, that's the solute concentration. And that is basically um, the concentration of the solute that you are um, th that you are measuring. So that if you know the concentration of the, sol of the so uh, solution, then you can calculate the uh, solute potential by plugging in the concentration of your solvent, of your solution. And then the last thing is the little i in here, and that i is the number of ions that your solute dissociates into. So if you have sodium chloride, for example, that will dissociate into two ions, sodium and chloride. If you um, have a solute that does not dissociate, like for example, glucose or fructose, uh, then you always use just a value of one. So then that, that number of I becomes one. But if you have sodium chloride, that would be two. If you have calcium chloride, that would be three and so forth. All right, let's do an example here. Let's calculate the, um, the solute um, potential for a 0.4 molar solution of glucose at room temperature, 20 degrees Celsius. So here's our, uh, our equation. So therefore, all we need to do is plug in the values for R. Ah, huh, there's a minus missing. Um, one for glucose. 293 for um, the 20 degrees Celsius, and then 0.4 molar for the solution with that given concentration. And so that will give you a concentration, uh, that will give you a, um, a solute potential of minus 0 0.937. And you see that little negative sign here, which comes from the, from the constant, that is what's causing this to be negative. All right. Okay, so why don't you take a minute and calculate on your own uh, the potential, the solute potential for a 0.1 molar solution of sodium chloride at 20 degrees Celsius. So just stop this recording for a little second, uh, write this out for yourself, just make sure that you understand how this works. Okay, did you do it? Here's the, uh, here's the solution. Of course, here's our, um, here's our constant. In this case, we have a value of two here because it dissociates into two, 293 Kelvin, 0.1 molar. Here's our um, solute potential in megapascal. All right, <clears throat> let's move on to the pressure potential. So for the pressure potential, in order to you know, sort of visualize what that is, think hydrostatic pressure. Think what happens on, uh, with pressure onto the water. Um, so the pressure potential is influenced by the turbo pressure, that is the positive pressure, that is the pressure that occurs inside a plant cell. Oftentimes you have turbo because water is sucked into the plant cell, but there's pressure from the outside from the cell wall onto the membrane, and that causes turbo pressure. And turbo pressure is pretty much what uh, allows a small an herb, like a small plant, that doesn't have a woody structure to just uh, stand up. So when it's losing turbo pressure, then it becomes limp and uh, wilted looking. And so that's what turbo pressure is. That's a positive value. Suction is also something that will um, affect the pressure potential. And that is a negative value. So um, think, for example, in the xylem of a plant, if it's um, transpiring water, there will be suction that will um, suck water out of the leaf and create more suction, negative pressure, inside the xylem to pull up more water from the bottom. So you can think dry sponge, right? that's something that will you know, suck up water or create a negative uh, pressure potential. <clears throat> um, so the pressure potential can be measured as well as the, um, the solute potential can be. And the pressure potential can be measured directly with a pressure probe. So those are little tiny um, probes that you poke into the cell and they have very fine sensors and they can measure the pressure 
inside onto the sensor. So that is the, the pressure probe that you can use. <clears throat> you can also indirectly measure the pressure potential by using something that's called the Scholander bomb. And the Scholander bomb measures the entire water potential. So if you're just interested in the water potential, then you just use the Scholander bomb um, values directly. But if you wanted to know the components and you can measure the solute potential and you can measure the water potential, then you can plug those into the equation and calculate the pressure potential if that is something that you're interested in. So what's the Scholander bomb? Well, the Scholander bomb is a device that is very frequently used in ecophysiology. Um, people who are going out into the field um, testing the water the water status of a given um, of a given plant. Farmers, for example, will need to know whether they need to uh, add to irrigate, whether they need to add extra water for their plants. So they might go out into their fields and measure and measure um, water potential. This is always done pre-dawn, just pre-dawn, just before the sun rises, because once the sun rises, things change in the plant. So there's more um, um, transpiration that occurs. Things get warmer, things get drier. There's sun that opens the stomata. So there's a lot of things that change within the plant, and we'll talk about some of those. But um, just as a, you know, just for you to know, um, in order to, um, to standardize all these conditions, Scholanderbaum measurements are usually done pre-dawn. So how does it work? You take a cutting of a plant, so you have your plant, and you insert it upside down into this pressure chamber. This is a thick metal chamber and has a thick metal um, lid, and it has a little rubber gasket in, inside here. And that rubber gasket has a hole through which you can stick the, uh, the leaf of the plant. And then here's a blow up for that. So you see this is the plant, and you see that there's um, water inside. And then when you cut the surface, um, the water recedes a little bit because there's always some suction. There's also always some transpiration going on from the from the leaves outside of the, uh, out of the leaves. And so water will be pulled away a little bit. That's pretty much what causes the premature wilting of cut flowers. If you buy flowers and you, um, you know, take them home and it takes you 20 minutes and you put them into the vase. The reason why you want to recut them before putting them into the vase is because you get this little bit of receding um, of the water column. And if you keep that air bubble in there, even if you put them in water after you put them back into the vase, you, have, you keep that little space of water, of, of air in there. And it's sort of like an embolism and water does not uh, get into the plant as easily um, as it did before. But that aside, so this, this will recede a little bit. And what you want to do with a Scholander bomb is you want to know how much pressure you have to apply for the plant, uh, to the plant for the water to come back to the cut surface. So in other words, to equalize the amount of pressure that you have to put in from the outside versus the pressure that inside the entire plant causes water to be sucked into the plant. Right? So if you can equalize that, then you have exactly the pressure, the negative pressure, the suction, inside the plant at a given time. So cut off that piece of leaf, stick it in there, apply pressure from the outside, and when that little water bubble forms here, then you look at the pressure gauge and you look at the pressure, the amount of pressure needed for this to occur, and you have your water potential. So that is the water potential. And then if you just plug that into your, um, into your equation, if you have one of the other two, the pressure or the solute potential, then you can always calculate out the third one that you, that you don't know. But as I said earlier, in most cases, um, people are just interested in the water potential in general, but not in all. We will see some examples. All right, so a few things to remember from this lecture. The water potential of pure water is zero, and the water potentials in plants are generally negative because the solutes in plants lower the potential and because water transpires out of the leaves, creating suction in the xylem. All right, so here's some summary that you might want to remember. So the water potential describes the hydration state of the plant and breaks it down into components influencing the state. So you want to remember that the water potential, zero is for pure water. Solutes lower the water potential. Water flow is passive. So just like in osmosis, osmosis water moves passively along a gradient. 
Water flows from areas of high water potential to areas of low water potential. So from a less negative to a more negative state. And that is, um, so lower water potential is a low, that's low free energy. So that is where it comes back to that, uh, to those two graphics that I showed you at the very beginning with the hexagonic and the endagonic reaction. We have to overcome energy in order to come to a, a different state and a different uh, energy state after the reaction occurs. Um, and in order to keep a negative water potential, that allows the plant to extract water from the soil. So as long as the water potential inside the plant is more negative than the potential, the water potential inside the soil, which of course also contains solutes that will make that uh, water uh, have a negative potential, as long as the plant can maintain a less negative water potential, then uh, the outside, then it can extract water from the soil. As soon as that changes, then um, the soil actually, actually extracts water from the plant. And there is an important example um, that you might want to consider for that, and that is um, salty, salty um, substances, substrates, substrates. So if you have a lot of salt in the soil, uh, which you do in certain areas just naturally, or which you can get from constant irrigation. So if you have irrigation water that is not completely pure, not double distilled, for example, it will contain some solutes, right? a little bit of, of salt, a little bit of um, nutrients, if you will. So if you drink water from the faucet, there's always some dissolved solutes in there. Well, in, in areas where there is no water um, that comes in through rain and that leaches out or washes out all these accumulating solutes in the soil, you just get the trickle from the, from the irrigation systems, all that salt will stay in the soil and it will accumulate there over years and years and years. And so you have a salination of the soil there. And so that's a very big deal for agriculture because the more salty the soil is, the harder it gets for the plant to extract water from the soil because the water potential in those soils um, becomes potentially lower than inside the plant. All right, so that's it for, uh, for water potential. We'll pick it up from here in class.